Hi Andreas, when I was alive, I wrote a book called 1984. It seems some of you lifees are using it as an instruction manual. Can Bitcoin save you? Thanks. Um, oh, George. I know. I mean, it's, it was supposed to be a cautionary tale, not an instruction manual. Um, you know, there's another author of your era who um, is actually also one of my favorite authors, which I really think, if you don't, um, uh, if you allow me to say, um, I'm going to let you finish, but have you heard of Aldous Huxley? <laughs> um, there, there's two seminal books that I think anybody interested in the current political climate should read to really, really understand some of the things that are happening in the world. Um, George Orwell's 1984 and, of course, um, his, I believe, previous book, Animal Farm, are critical reading. Um, they're, they're also funny, sad, tragic, gripping, great tales. Um, but... 1984 tells only part of the story. 1984 is about a technologically dystopian society that is centralized under a um, boot-on-your-neck statist, really, really fascist control system. And it came from George Orwell's understanding of the politics of fascism as they were emerging in the early 1930s. Um, all across Europe and <clears throat> and also in the United States where fascism was very popular and still is. But um, George Orwell really imagined this as an all-powerful state that subjugates its citizens primarily through brutal oppression in a very overt manner. Aldous Huxley wrote another book called Brave New World and I really do recommend you read that. Aldous Huxley had a different perspective, which is actually even more powerful. Again, a dystopia of a society under heavy control. But in this case, it wasn't the overt control of violence and fear, but instead control through cheap entertainment um, by tickling the dopamine centers of pliable subjects through empty entertainment um, that kept, kept the people occupied with triviality so that they would miss the horrific things happening in their society, <clears throat> Facebook. And between Orwell and Huxley, we see what has emerged today is really kind of the perfect mix of the two, because not only do you get Aldous Huxley's entertainment-based enslavement um, through social media, but beautifully enough, there is a compact between the social media companies that feed this data into various private corporations and, of course, law enforcement, intelligence agencies, government uh, regulators, and others to bring to fruition at the same time George Orwell's 1984. Now, you're asking, can Bitcoin save you? Um, yes, but very, very indirectly. It saves us primarily by doing two things. One, it breaks the monopoly uh, control over money, which hopefully over the long run leads to a weakened state that cannot fund oppressive operations without the consent of the governed. So if a state does not have the consent of the governed but has control over the monetary system, they can fund all of their oppressive operations without any consent simply through hidden forms of taxation such as inflation. And that's enough, because then votes don't matter, elections don't matter, um, tax rates don't matter. Um, you're paying a very low tax rate, it's just that your dollar is worth less and less and less every year. And through the Cantillon effect, uh, trillions and trillions and trillions are being funneled into the open malls of Plutarchs um, that are controlling you. So. That's one aspect of how Bitcoin saves us. The other aspect, which I think is equally important, is not just the money function. It's the broader function of creating trust networks that are decentralized in nature. These trust networks can be used in other areas, primarily in areas of governance, um, uh, but also self-governance of various communities. These participatory trust systems can be used to re-decentralize the internet, to produce technologies and visions like the Web3 vision that comes from Ethereum, 
uh, which is the third iteration of the web, uh, the decentralized web and things like that. Now, whether you agree that Ethereum is the right way to do this or not, the vision of re-decentralizing the web, of re-decentralizing applications and storage and um, programmable smart contracts and money in such a way as to be able to build entire complex modular systems that are decentralized, that have decentralized governance models, decentralized autonomous organizations and things like that. To me, that's a compelling vision. Um, and that compelling vision is one of the reasons I'm so interested in that aspect of Ethereum's technology. So um, can Bitcoin save us? Yes, because it opened the door for both of these things to emerge. It created the foundation uh, on which all of these other things are built. So when it comes to save us, it may not be called Bitcoin and it, it may be a secondary effect that's way removed. Uh, kind of like how everybody runs Linux. They just kind of call it Android or they call it the subsystem of their Windows or they call it the underlying POSIX infrastructure of their Mac operating system. And it's still kind of Linux in every device everywhere. You just never know it's there. Um, Linux won by disappearing into the background. Maybe Bitcoin saves us. Not because we use and know we are using Bitcoin, but because it kind of fades into the background as an infrastructure technology that has changed our very conception of how trust works in a network society. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like, and share. All my work is shared for free. So if you want to support it, join me on Patreon.